Hello everyone, just for this episode with Josh Chetwin starts, we talk a lot here about oral history of clubs and teams about trying to document things, which is something I'm looking to try and do a bit more in, in the new year. So if you want to come on and talk about the origins of your club and some of the historic moments that they've been through, please get in touch with the show and let's get um, the information detailed. Also, if there's teams out there such as Enfield Spartans and London Warriors that are no longer around, um, teams that don't exist anymore, it'd be great to have some people on from those areas and clubs that know the history, that like to share their stories and also give some more insight about how the teams were created and formed. So if that seems like something you want to do, get in touch, BritishBaseballPodcast at gmail.com or find me on social medias at BritBaseballPod. Cheers. You're listening to the British Baseball Podcast. Hello, baseball family. Matthew here again with the one and only Josh Chetwin for another episode of the British Baseball Podcast. Josh, how are we? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for having me on to chat. Yeah, it's, uh, we've been talking off-season about lots of things. We've been involved in lots of projects, especially Project Cobb stuff, uh, doing lots of stuff for GB stats and coverage. And we were having a chat not too long about, about coming back on and trying to do a bit more about getting some more audio history of um, British baseball teams. Yeah, I know I, I said this to you off air, but I really believe that your podcast sort of serves as, in many ways, an oral history for British baseball. We don't have a lot of outlets where people come on and talk about their experiences and their history and their meaningful people within the context of, of British baseball. And so I love that about your podcast and was hoping to potentially contribute from that standpoint. Thanks, man. Yeah, but that is what I've been trying to say in a really bad Salford way for about three years. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm trying to do with the, with this show. But I always go, and just end up spewing rubbish out. But thank you for summing that up for me so perfectly. I might have that as my my snippet for the start. This is what the British Baseball Podcast is. Over to Josh. There we go. Uh, so you have been on before uh, a few times. Um, so what have you been up to in since we last spoke in 2019? Yeah, it's it's been a minute, hasn't it? Um, yeah. I uh, So the two things that have sort of taken a lot of my focus is that I have leaned in on issues related to climate change. Uh, I worked for uh, an advocacy organization, a nonprofit for a number of years doing communications in terms of trying to help spur policies to address climate change and, and spur climate action. And then a little less than a year ago, I started working for the state of Colorado as the director of climate communications. So I'm working sort of inside now uh, to try and work with a state that's pretty progressive on these issues and, and learn more and work with people who are really smart who are actually implementing policy. And then the other thing I've done is uh, I hung up my cleats a handful of years ago. My last games were played with Southampton in Barcelona. We uh, made it to the finals of a European Cup competition. Got a hit in my last AB and uh, hung him up. And since then, I've leaned into the sport of curling. And so I've been playing curling for a number of years and been really blessed to get on a team that was very ambitious. We played on the World Curling Tour, which is the professional tour for curling. And uh, fingers crossed, looks this year will uh, actually be one of the top eight teams in the U.S. to play for the U.S. National Men's Championship, which will be pretty exciting. Yeah, we were talking before about how awesome it is that you sort of you feel like you you pass your time in one sport and yet you, you're at your top of your game in another sport and you barely look a day over forty. <laughs> I am many days over forty, Matt, but I appreciate I know, it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think one thing though, and I play with two of my teammates. You play a four four person team. Two of my teammates are in their mid to lower twenties, and I think a lot of it's state of mind. I I like to still remain young at heart. Uh, I have one player who's 26, I think, acts more adult than I do. I still have that sort of childish enthusiasm for sports, and I get such a thrill out of competing. And so I, I've been just really lucky to be with people who have brought me aboard, and uh, you know, I continue to work hard. And my body shockingly has held up for people who remember me when I was playing at the end of my British baseball career. I mean, I'd had a couple of knee surgeries and was hobbling around, but I've sort of figured out a way to... I mean, I have little injuries here and there, but to, to, to keep on going, at least for a little while longer. So, Yeah, man. And uh, uh, the podcast has just finished its second season, the Johnny and Josh show? Yes, I think it's our th- it was our third season, actually. So, 
Yeah, I think so. No, no, no worries. Yeah, we did two seasons where we were doing it uh, pretty much weekly. And then this past season, we were doing it uh, monthly. Just, uh, you know, takes a lot of time. But it's a really great excuse for for Johnny, Eric, David, and myself just to get together. David was pretty busy, so he missed a number of shows. But, uh, you know, we're still such close mates. And just a chance for us to chat and have a laugh. It's great. It's nice that there are some people, a handful, I mean, increasingly fewer, right, who know who we were, because that was a long time ago now. And uh, but the ones that that do remember us from back when we were on our Channel 5 days, uh, it's just really gratifying that they appreciate us just sort of sitting around and chatting baseball. Yeah, you saw like the Star Trek Next Generation to original series now. It's still a great, still a great thing to, to watch and listen to. That's very kind of you. Oh, it is. It is. It's. Uh, I, I. I do find. I, I get a lot of inspirations from a lot of sources across the community. You've got um, Batflip and Nurse, and you've got Ball Cats and Bagpipes, and then it'd be daft not to say, you know, the, the OGs. Just seeing other people work and how they do their thing it is inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line with everything you were talking about curling, baseball, broadcasting, it's really a lot about chemistry uh, and and how you get along with the other people. It helps rise your game, and I felt like. Certainly Johnny, Eric, David, and myself were, were so close that it helps us do a better job in terms of that type of broadcasting. I feel that way about sport too. Yeah. Maybe that's what I'm going wrong. I just I just don't like myself. I've just got such bad chemistry with myself. Oh, stop. <laughs> stop. You always do well with your guests, man. I'm I'm a big fan. Oh yeah. Well, well, I need to get some people on here that, that know what they're talking about. I don't go bloody clue. That's what I want for Christmas this year. You know, I've got my reference. Oh, it's not on because my GoPro's not working. For those that are watching this on YouTube, I've got my bookshelf that's just over here because you're trying to turn around knocking everything over. Nice. Ever so slightly. We have Mr. Josh Chetwin's baseball in Europe book. Hey. Moneyball. I've got this book of baseball here, which is oh, one second. By Alan Smith and Alan Bloomfield. I remember that book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Blokes of Summer by Harvey Soccer. It's a good book. I yeah. highly recommend it. Yep. Yeah, it's a great book. Uh, Stealing Home, um, which is um, Paddy Johnson. It's like a baseball comic diary. The Outstanding Youth Coach by Cody Kane. Conflict by Ryan Ferguson. Gary Beddingfield's Baseball in Hawaii during World War II. And I've got the old timers baseball folder from 2013 do you have either yeah. of uh, joe grades uh books in there i don't i, do, I do have them digitally though um, yes i did i did get the pds from project cob not a sponsor but they're free anyway so you all know where the links are um yeah the nine aces and a is it nine aces and a, a nine aces and a joker yeah and a joker and yeah what happened so, to villa yeah yeah what happens to villa yeah, yeah. i've got the t-shirt birmingham av i got a custom nice AV t-shirt made up um, just because you've got to take your nerd them a, a little bit higher. And then just a bit further up here, which just out of shot, is my Andy Brown painting as well. So Fantastic. Trying to keep myself around as much British baseball culture. Well, you, you, you have to give me your address. I'll send you uh, British Baseball in the West Ham Club, which was sort of the first book I did with Brian Bell. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, Appreciate I, it. Yeah. To, to be quite honest, we've come so far in terms of our knowledge of British baseball history since I, I did that book and. I think it came out in 2006 something like mm. that uh, it's it's just really impressive the people who have leaned in uh and and really sort of have even dug far deeper than i was able to dig at that time and we have so many more uh, assets and and materials and and ways to sort of really understand uh the legacy of, of baseball in great britain oh yeah and a big shout out to andrew taylor does the folkston baseball chronicle i mean I wish I had his time and resources. I've been dying to get him on for a monthly segment, just like one episode whenever he can, just to dedicate to it. But I think he should do his own thing, get his own podcast over him, because I'll tell you what, I'd, I'd be on that whenever yeah. he gets it out. It's fascinating stuff that he's finding. It's so yeah. good. 100% agree. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, so let's talk a bit more about uh, club history then. Um, nice little segue. You wanted to, to bring some more stuff about the, the Mets, um, men senior team from uh, from way back when so over, over to you let's let's chat yeah I, I was hoping to kind of tell the story because i know obviously the history of the london mets since my involvement has grown exponentially had tremendous success over mm. the past decade but i really most of the people who were there when 
I started the senior team are gone. I don't, in fact, don't even know if any now with Jonathan Cram and moving on uh, were even there in that first season in 2007. I thought there might be value in sort of just getting down that history. So people, including people who are involved with the London Mets now sort of know how the team came to be in the first place, because it was already a really successful youth program and they were having players who were starting to graduate out and they didn't have any sort of senior program. And I'd moved back to Great Britain in the summer of 2006. And I had played previously when I lived in, in the UK with the Bracknell team. But when I came back, I, I had understood that Brighton, Brighton Buccaneers, which had been sort of one of the great teams of that period in the early aughts, uh, was sort of struggling. And so when I came back, I played one season with them their final season, uh, because I wanted an opportunity to play with some of those players who I'd known for a very long time, guys like Ben Go Gogan, uh, Martin Staub, uh, most of the other ones that sort of moved on, the Martin Dutton and David Donaldson and Alex Malhudis, Will Linter and George Linter. But I, I wanted to play with them. So I played with them that season. The team sort of just kind of crumbled. And so in 2007, right before the season started, I was sort of figuring out what I was going to do for baseball. And Neil Warren, who at the time was, I believe, the president of the London Mets, came to me and said, look, we'd like to start a senior program in which we create an opportunity for our junior players to be able to play at a senior level. And I, that really appealed to me because the whole reason I moved to the UK in the first place, I already played for the national team for many years, was to uh, be able to help develop the sport. So the first thing I did, it, my the timing for this was really lucky because, I mean, sad for British baseball, lucky for me and what I was trying to do is that not only had the Brighton Buccaneers folded at the end of the 2006 season, but so had the London Warriors, which had been one of the really top programs for, for many, many years. Now, Alan Smith had run and his family had run and had so many great players who played there. So I knew that there would be some availability for players who could bolster a junior roster and give them the type of teaching opportunity that we hoped we could create. So I first re reached out to Simon Pohl, who was arguably the best player, uh, two-way player for sure, during this era uh, from Australia. I ultimately got his British passport, played on the national team and uh, convinced him to sort of throw his lot in with me to do this. And then the other player who I was able to get who had played for Bracknell, who I knew very well when I'd worked for Major League Baseball is Jason Holowaty. So I sort of felt like, okay, with the three of us, we can put together a team, even if it's all the rest of the players or juniors and be competitive, not win anything, but at least give them an opportunity to learn the sport and, and do all that. And uh, if, if I'm just rambling on and you want to stop and ask a question, that's fine. Otherwise, I can kind of just sort of no, spit no, it keep, all out. Yeah, keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm all okay. ears. Yeah, I'm going to try and keep notes and come back to anything for the final. But yeah, keep keep on going. Gotcha. Yeah. So so I got I got the two of them. And then uh, what was interesting was despite the fact that you had three players who were very established in British baseball, at the time, there was still some discussion about whether there was going to be relegation and promotion up to the National Baseball League. So that was not a foregone conclusion that we were going to be able to play at the top level that year. So I remember uh, at the old Charlotte Street offices for Major League Baseball, we had to go in and make a pitch that we could put together a team that could be competitive at that level to the British Baseball Federation board. And I, I, we must have been compelling enough because they agreed to it. And then we had the pressure of putting together a roster. So we knew there were going to be players coming up from the junior program and there were a handful of them i mean the ones that ended up playing so what happened was is that a number of these players came and then they decided they didn't want to make the commitment because we had sort of indicated okay you got to come out to practice once a week and then play on the weekends so uh jonathan Cramman was one of the first teenager along with callum woods who was another really good player who come out of that program uh, and then etienne uh, savory who was a pitcher who had tremendous talent he had some eyesight problems but those were probably the three biggest and then Neil Warren's son, Billy Warren. And there was a, a, a player by the name of Christian Gonzalez. I remember calling Sam Sproul like half a dozen times trying to get him to come out. He was a contemporary of theirs, but that year he didn't come out. In fact, he didn't come out until a number of years later after I had left the program. Uh, and then a couple of other players. Uh, but in the end, uh, once we started putting the team together, uh, really it was Jonathan, uh, Cramman, 
and uh, Callum Woods and Etienne a little bit. I think he threw about 10 innings. And so you put, put the numbers together and we were still now trying to hustle for players. And so it was, it was uh, you know, a bit challenging to get players. I think we might've put out an ad. The one advantage we did have is that Neil had said that we could hire a coach from the US to be a coach for the junior programs and play on the senior team. So that was my job to find that person. And I had a sort of a philosophy about that, which is that I didn't want to get a, the best player necessarily, like a division one player, because I sort of felt like those guys, particularly at that era, they didn't understand European baseball. And I really didn't expect them to come in and really appreciate your playing at Finsbury Park. This is before they even had the apron there. You know, yeah. you, you put up the fence. So I was like, a Division three player is probably my ideal, really good Division three player. Someone, ideally, because at that level, you sometimes had crossover players who could pitch and play the field. I wanted someone who was going to be able to pitch, but also swing the bat. So I found a guy named Kyle Gardner, who had gone to the University of Redlands. It was a great Division three uh, conference in California. It's where Occidental is located, Pitzer, it's like people like Alex Smith and Bradley Marcelino, they all played their college baseball in, in this league. Uh, Mike Rennery, number of GB players. So it was a league I was familiar with, players who I knew could kind of understand. Kyle was perfect. So he was going to be a, a pitcher and play outfield for us. So now we had sort of four competent players, two good juniors, particularly in, in Jonathan and Callum. And then it was filling in the slots. And as mentioned, because the two teams, Brighton and the Warriors had folded, it gave us an opportunity to get some players. Now, most of the guys who had played for the Warriors, Michael Osborne, Grant Del Zappo, they went to Richmond to play. So Cody Kane was on there and he was able to recruit those players. And so I really looked to the Brighton guys and Alex played a few games for us, but he was still living overseas, same as Will, he was playing at Menlo. Uh, but George Lintern, who was really looking for a better opportunity in Europe, said, I'll play with you until I find somewhere else, which turned out amazingly. He was, you know, really at the height of his power. I mean, he had a number of good years after that, but, you know, a really talented player. Yeah. So we were able to have him. And then Ben Moore came, who was a catcher for uh, the Buccaneers as well, too. He wasn't as talented a player, but very enthusiastic. And at the time was working in advertising. So he was able to, he, had, he was doing advertising for Nike. So he's able to get us uniforms, which was a big deal because at the start of the season, we were literally wearing the, the kids' uniforms, the like Meteor's uniforms. At London, there were these blue uniforms, like didn't fit anyone. Like we're all wearing these tight uniforms to start with. So uh, picked up a few other players, guys with like high school experience in the US, guy named Satya Patel played third base for us. A couple Canadians, Kyle Hickson, who played a number of years uh, and Sean Sullivan. Um, it, so it was, it felt very ragtag, uh, and my expectations were incredibly low. Uh, Simon was going to pitch and so was Kyle, but we really didn't have any other pitching. So I ended up becoming the third pitcher and I was just a catcher, just throwing, uh, basically. But th that year I kind of dropped down a little bit, was getting a little more run on the ball. So it was actually the one year I ever pitched a full season and, and was reasonably successful. I think I was like the one, the project Cobb award for best two way player that year. Cause I was just okay at pitching. So we, we got into the season and, you know, we, we split the first week against Richmond, Richmond and Croydon that year were the really good teams. And I was, uh, you know, we were able to split that first week. I'm like, okay, well, maybe we can be competitive. The Croydon team was amazing. It was really made up a bunch of Australian players and they did something that is unparalleled in the modern history of British baseball, which is they uh, went undefeated in the regular season. And the only reason we made the playoffs back then, it was still uh, two teams from the North, two teams from the South. So only uh, Corden was going to go and it was going to be between us and Richmond. And we had split the first weekend and we had one other weekend against them. So it was whoever was going to if we split, I don't know exactly what the breakdown would have been if we were tied, but really if one team swept that double header, they were going to be the team that was going to get the second slot. Yeah. So we go to Richmond and I was really lucky that weekend. Will Lintern happened to be home. He didn't have a team, so he was going to play with us. So we pulled in Will to catch, which was a huge upgrade. Ben didn't have a very good arm. He was behind the plate. We had another guy named Sean Sullivan. They were okay, but having him there was going to be a, a huge, huge deal. And uh, we win the first game because Kyle, our import wins. It. And then the second game, 
I started and we ended up winning the game. I actually uh, was pulled from the game. I was sort of a no hitter, but I was pretty wild and, and I was having cramps. Simon Pohl comes in. He gives up a hit in his first at bat. He's like, I'm so sorry, Josh. I'm like, I don't care. Let's just win this game. We end up winning it. So we get into the playoffs and um, we were definitely the underdog again. Croydon, I, we played Croydon the last weekend of the season and Croydon crushed us. I mean, they were really good. Uh, Michael Accuse uh, uh, was on that team who, you know, Hall of Famer. Yeah. And he was young. He wasn't even one of the better players on that team at the time. And uh, I remember them, uh, it was at Finsbury Park. They had a bottle of champagne and they broke open the bottle of champagne after having the undefeated season because I think they just figured, okay, we're, we're going, we're going to win a championship. Obviously, we've beaten everyone here. No one in the North is going to be good. And then we had to, a really hard decision. I remember being on the Channel 5 show and talking to Johnny Gould of all people about like, what should we do for pitching? Because we had three guys who threw, we only had two guys who threw like 11 innings or less. And then me, Kyle, and Simon threw every other inning. And so, and I was not that good. Simon was good, but he had had some arm problems. So was he going to be able to last in a full game? And then Kyle was our one really good pitcher. So the question was in the semifinals, we were playing uh, Liverpool and Martin Godsall was going to pitch for them. And Martin yeah, is yeah. a fantastic pitcher. So here it was, okay, do I waste Simon or Kyle in that game to get us to the finals, which was the best two out of three, knowing that, I was going to, you know, there was no way I was going to match up as a pitcher against Croydon, whereas the other two guys had a shot at it. So I decided, I, I had this attitude, it was funny, two years later when I was playing for Bracknell and we won a national championship there, it was a very similar situation where I was thinking about like, you just, sometimes you actually don't throw your best pitcher in these long weekends because you're really going for the championship and you're going to take your chance early that you may lose and go out and maybe not make the finals to give yourself a chance that if you do make it through that stage, you're going to have a chance. And it was similar to that when we were with Bracknell uh, two years later. But anyway, what ended up happening was I pitched against Martin. Shockingly, I just had a great game. It was, a pitch. It was the best game I ever pitched. Uh, they had a, a guy from Rutgers at the time. Rutgers is a U.S. university, reasonable. He was really good, but I was able to really control the rest of the lineup. I remember we had Ben Moore behind the plate, and I was so worried about people stealing it. Anytime someone got off, gone, I would do like six or seven pickoffs and then quick pitch so that they wouldn't have a chance to steal. Yeah. And uh, they scored an unearned run in the first. They were up one nothing. And in the fifth, we scored two. We were clawed two across. And, you know, Martin was, or uh, Gotti was just a really good pitcher. And so once we got up two to one and we got to the fifth, I brought in Kyle. I figured, okay, you can throw two innings here and then throw another game. We won the game two to one. So we got there and then it was against Croydon. We thought, okay, this is going to be crazy. And this was one of those great moments in, in baseball where you're not the better team. You're the worst team, but everything just turns out right for you. And in that first game, Simon pitched. I remember them hitting lasers at George Lintern at shortstop. And he made these amazing plays and we ended up winning that game. And Croydon was crushed because they lost their perfect season. They're all Australian. They went out, got so drunk the next day because i was like if we go to a third game we're done we have to win the, we have to win two straight otherwise we have zero pitching left so uh kyle came back we ended up boat racing which means we scored a ton of runs we ended up winning that championship and that in the the bracknell championship two years later and the next year we at that point then we were an established quantity people wanted to play with us the team we had the next year we beat richmond in the finals was just probably one of the best teams in modern British baseball history in my mind, because there was still a reasonable amount of competition at that point. You know, Richmond was still a good team and we lost one game that whole season. We really should have been undefeated. I, I still, I was the only one who really cared about that because I was the one who cared about like history. And this was our chance to like go undefeated, win a championship, be like really the only team to do that. But there were a few games I was going to have to miss over the course of the season. The one game I missed that second year in 2008 was against Croydon, who's all their players had left. They had won two games all season. I was like, okay, we're easily going to run, run that game. And they lost a game. So we, we went, whatever, 24 and one or whatever, and then won the championship. But that first year, uh, it was just really exciting to put together a team. I think my only disappointment was, again, our mandate was to really have a lot of under 25 GB players. 
And in the end, we had just a handful. We had a guy named Daniel Ferguson who played with us, who ended up playing a lot of softball, but you know, baseball, uh, he wasn't as strong a player, but found time for him. He definitely got to play. Jonathan and Callum, Etienne, Christian Gonzalez played a little, but then ended up quitting. Billy, I think, threw a couple innings for us. And then George was also under 25. So we had a handful of guys who, who did meet that mandate. It wasn't as much as we wanted, but uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. It was sort of the start of that. And you know, then they were able to have teams at a lower level and they were able to build out from there. So uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I think we got really lucky that we were successful to begin with. And I think that helped develop London Mets at a senior level, probably faster than it might have been. Because you look at other programs like Hertz, it's done such a great job with development, but they didn't get that kickstart that, that the Mets were able to get at the senior level that we were able to give them over those first couple of years. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. What a great insight into that first season. I, like, I didn't even need to ask any questions. And you, you ticked everything. It's like, the only time I don't pre-send questions to anybody and you just did <laughs> everything that would have would have asked anyway. So with the foundations now laid for that first season, what challenges did you face uh, heading to that second season? I mean, the second season was was relatively easy as a result. I mean, I had the advantage, obviously, of also broadcasting on television. So I had a little bit of notoriety. And at that point, especially with Croydon sort of starting to not be as strong, um, we sort of were able to vacuum up a lot of the players who had come to London and were looking for a team. And the one player we got was a guy named Troy Cantor, who was a fantastic player, just a two-way player. So he gave us very similar to like a Kyle Gardner, but he wasn't our coach. He happened to be teaching there. And he was just a, a great guy, an excellent baseball player, kind of had the American football mentality, though. He was a very rough and tumble guy, lo- lovely human. And that allowed us then to use our coach position to bring in Brian Essery. And I, I presume that's a name you've heard before. He played for the Great Britain national team for many years and served as a coach. Just a fantastic human being. He brought his whole family out, uh, was an amazing pitcher. So now we had Kyle, we had, um, no, excuse me. Now we had Troy, we had Brian, we had Simon, and then we had a, a, a pitcher, a Cuban pitcher named uh, Ernesto Bolifer. So we had four really top shelf pitchers. And I think if there was any challenge, it was making sure they all got to play and that, uh, you know, you have to make a roster when you're playing two games on the weekend, mm. when you're coaching these teams, especially at this high level, because everyone feels they're really strong players and you have to really be careful to make sure everyone's getting playing time, that the communication is really good, that people know what their role is and that no one feels slighted. And be quite honest, there was a player on that team, I don't want to mention his name, who felt very slighted. And the next year, I was going to pull back. I was actually going to play for London one more year, and I had intended to pull back. But I wanted to play some. And Alex Pike had uh, been a player on that team the second year, an Australian player who was very involved with the London Mets for many years. And then this other player was sort of working with him to run the team. And the first week I went out, I said, look, you know, I have a young child. I really don't want to come out if I'm going to play. If you don't want me to play, just let me know. It's totally cool. This is your team now. And he was like, fine. No, you'll absolutely do it. Alex wasn't there for the first game. The other player was. The other player doesn't play me. And I was like, what's going on? And he then goes off on me telling me, you know, you disrespected me by not allowing me to play last year. Cast a lot of aspersions towards me. I was heartbroken because I had felt like one thing I was proud of is I was a communicator. Everyone sort of knew what their role was. He and I had talked about him playing in the championship weekend and uh, what I promised him he would play. He did play. He was going to play in one of the final in the finals game, but the other team started getting closer and I told him get ready. And then he ended up not getting in and he took it very personally and he really took it out on me. And so I was like, that's fine. I understand I, this is your team. I'm done. So I left the team after the first weekend and played for Bracknell uh, in that final year, which was great for me to come all the way around. When I first played in 2002, I played for Bracknell. And to me, the early aughts were, were a bit of a golden age for British baseball at that level, because one of the things I worry about with British baseball now is it's not good for the sport if one team dominates. It's uh, really, you know, you need to have competition. And if one team is consistently winning a national championship, 
you know, there, I have worries about that. But back in, in the early 2000s, uh, Windsor was still playing at that level and yeah. they were excellent. You had the London Warriors, which were excellent. Brighton was still at the height of their powers. And then you had Bracknell, which was really a, a, a youth team with a few players, kind of the model that I'd hoped for London, but it really was that at the time. You had guys like Phil Matthews, the Trask brothers, uh, a player by the name of Stephen Brown. Um, Liam was still young playing on that team. So there were a lot of really young players. That was me and Tom Gillespie, uh, who were sort of the, the older, more established players and, and Rob Rance. And so coming back to Bracknell was great because a lot of those players who I played with, Phil, uh, a player by the name of Henry Collins, uh, Matt Maitland, these were all players who were born and bred British players who had now gotten older. Uh, the Trask brothers were both on that team. And, and so it, I, it, they did me a favor, the Mets, by that situation happening, because then I got to go to London, and it was me and Adam Roberts, who was a fantastic ball player, Mike Stewart, who was a fantastic ball player, the three of us who were veteran players, and then these you know guys who had been born and bred British players, and we went into that weekend for the finals, also a real long shot to win it, because Richmond was an excellent team. They had Ryan Bird. Uh, they also had Cody Kane. So you had these two, you know, at that point, you have two dominant pitchers and a number of other really, so, you know, Zop was there, Grant Del Zoppo was playing for them, Michael Osborne. They, they should, you know, they were the team that was probably going to win. And going back to what I was saying before is we lost our first game to London and it was a, uh, a double knockout the way it was set up that year. And so we were going to have to win three straight games in order to win the championship. And Rob's attitude was, okay, let's throw Maitland, who was, you know, we had no margin for error in terms of our pitching. He was like, let's throw Maitland against uh, Hertz, who we were going to play next, who were the weakest team at the time. Uh, and, you know, so make sure we win and move on. I was like, Rob, don't do that. I remember having this conversation. I said, Rob, save Maitland, because if we make it to the next game, it'll be against the London Mets, who that season had a depleted roster because Phil Clark who's a longtime British baseball player. He was getting married that weekend. And so a number of players were going to miss it. So that gave us an advantage too. It all the stars aligned for us. But I said, throw Mike Cattermall, who is a longtime British baseball player, okay pitcher, not great, okay, uh, against Hertz. Because if we can't beat them with him on the mound with our hitting, there's no way we're going to win anything else. We're not going to win this championship. So let's take our gamble there much in the way in that first year where the gamble was me pitching against Scott Martin. Let's take our gamble there and give us our best chance. And if we do win that, that we could beat the Mets with Maitland and then Henry Collins can throw the final against, um, against Richmond. And it worked out. Uh, we ended up just, again, just out hitting Hertz in that first game. Maitland threw a great game against London. And then we had Henry to sort of go against Cody Kane. And we had a great game. You know, we just ended up hitting got a ton of hits. I was sort of like my, my last game on British soil. I went five for five. It was fantastic. Uh, and we just, it was interesting because I think like three of four of us, me, Mike Stewart, um, Adam Roberts and Phil Matthews got all the hits and, but we scored like 13 runs or something like that. So, and so I got to go out a winner. It was great. The last three years I played, we won national championships. And it was great for Bracknell because, you know, they still exist. It's such a wonderful place. You know, Paul Vernon, so many great people have come out of that program, but they haven't played at that level again. They played a couple more years and then sort of fell out of that top level. So for them to have had a national championship at the highest level, they'll always have that. And, and that makes me happy for that, that club. That's a fantastic right. team. Got all that on your last game. Did you manage to get any sort of memorabilia? Because I know you're a, you're a collector of GB memorabilia and baseball history. Did you get anything like a, a game ball or or anything like a signed bat or anything from your last, last game? No, I mean, I have some pictures from it. So I certainly have memories from that. I mean, it's fun. I, I definitely love memorabilia. Uh, I definitely have so much British baseball ephemera, but in the eras before me, you know, programs in the 1930s. In fact, you can see right behind me, that is the program from the first game of the uh, England-US uh, World Cup in the 30s. Uh, that actually, that one right there is the first ever international between Italy and Spain. It was a postcard from it. So I love that, that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't have anything. I certainly had the memories um, and just 
those, those three years, the two starting the London Mets program, us winning national championships in that Brockton one, it was just uh, indelible. I mean, such gratitude for the players I played with during that period. I mean, you know what it's like, and everyone who's listening to you play baseball knows what it's like, you know, they become your band of brothers and sisters, the people you play with in sport. Uh, and so uh, just great relationships. I still, you know, I'll email with Phil Matthews or Ryan Trask, uh, you know, or, you know, write with them on social media. And so many of those players, you know, si- Simon Pohl take the piss out of me still to this day, whenever something baseball comes up. Cause I was, I was the best bad player you'll ever see. Like my swing was not great, but I just got hits, you know, and he was always so amused by that, that I was <laughs> just was not, I was not pretty at, at the game, but uh, just sort of figured out a way to make it work for me. Brilliant. With, with all your history and knowledge of baseball and, and the time in, in Britain, if you go go back to one period and watch a couple of games, when would you go back to? Uh, no doubt the the 30s and the John Moore's uh, professional league years. Uh, you know, Roland Gladue, uh, you know, Lefty Wilson, Super Bowl, the, the Hall of Fame, Ross Kendrick. I would be really curious to just see what the standard was. Because you had some players there. I mean, in the 1890s, there's some interesting Arlie Latham and, and players who played major leagues from that period too. So that would be interesting. But at least the 30s, it's a little more similar to the baseball that we play today still. And I would have loved to see, A, I would have loved to have seen games, you know, in dog racing tracks yeah. and the way the fields were sort of fit into there. Uh, but I would have also liked to have seen the skill of players uh, during that period. To me, I think it's just... It was the halcyon days, right? People yeah. were professional players. I, I just, I've always been very fascinated with, obviously I wrote a book that focuses on that, but uh, yeah, that would be it for sure. Yeah. I think I'd love to have just been in the crowds amongst people that had never seen or heard it before. And just like, what is this? And just trying to get some of the reactions and just, just seeing what the interest was like, because there's, you look back at the stuff that's, that's on Cobb. And about the attendances and, and the people, and especially like the, the way the negativity, negativity around the press of that time, trying to sort of knock it down. I would love to have been able to have a chat. I don't mean that in a, in a Salford sort of way, like I'm going to have a chat with the with a journalist, but I have a just like just wonder why why they had such an issue with it, or just you know if if they actually enjoyed it and just seeing what the what the takeaways yeah. actually were. Well, I mean, there was so much infrastructure. I have a, a, a wristband with a, a medallion, you know, a metal medallion from White City Supporters Club. So, they, I mean, you know, could you imagine that today? Like a London Met Supporters Club with like this nice, you know, wristband that had like this little metal on it and the programs were really cool. Yeah. I mean, they really made a go of it. And so I, I think it would have been really exciting to see your points well taken. The media was very skeptical but that uh, clearly th- there was fan support. You had thousands of people going to games. I mean, there were there been other efforts for that, but that one seemed to really cotton a little bit t- to the British sporting landscape for, for that brief period. Yeah. I was talking to my grand not too long ago, right? She's in her nineties now. And I was, I was so hopeful that, cause like there's, there's all the stuff like with Swinton uh, that, that was quite close uh, with them getting Stratford Saints name wrong for, for it being, what they ended up being. And I was just like, please tell me you managed to see something just so I could have her on again. My, my grand's brilliant. She's absolutely bonkers. And I would love to have had her on here as a guest, just, just to hear a waffle on about stuff. And I, I was like, please tell me you saw something. I heard something. And she's like, no, I don't really know what baseball is. I was like, ah, oh, grand. Uh, oh, uh. Opportunity miss. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so important. And I said this at the top of the, the show that you get down the oral histories for people who are older. I interviewed one of the last surviving members of the U.S. Olympic team that played in Germany uh, in the 19. 19- 36 games, right? Oh, 1936. Wow. His name is Dow Wilson. And he, it, the, a lot of those elements are in my British baseball and the West Ham book because they then came to the UK. They played White City. They played West Ham and West Ham beat that US Olympic team. And it was just knowing that you were capturing something that otherwise would have been lost. Uh, is very important. I mean, that's the whole purpose of Project Cobb, mm-hmm. uh, the British Baseball Hall of Fame, is to memorialize these elements of, of history. It's, it's a history. It, 
it's not just a baseball history. It's not just a sports history. It's a cultural history too, because it speaks to people in a time and a place and their experiences. And part of those experiences are baseball. And so uh, to me, that's, that's really valuable. So what you're doing now, hopefully, you know, my feeling is that you end up on Project Cobb, like a lot of your, you know, the ones that relate to, you know, you interviewing people who have history with British baseball. And that gives an opportunity for people 20 or 30 years from now to hear the voices of the people who played before them. Yeah, that, that's really what I'm hoping is that anyone that comes on can document their time and just give an account of the fun that they had and the teams and the players and the atmosphere. And just to get a, like a, I, I really wanted to try and get like an audio fanzine type of thing and just have like really cheesy advert segments to, to put in it and just like make up my own things. But it just became, I mean, it's, it's hard enough just doing this on my own. Uh, oh, yeah. the research editing the like converting of files and blah 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 all the boring stuff no one <laughs> needs to know about for making a pod well that's why you got eric right you know yeah well i mean <laughs> but, but british baseball has always been a labor of love matt i mean every mm. i've said this all the time the clubs that survive are the ones that have infrastructure because a lot of these clubs start with a level of enthusiasm from a single individual who through force of personality starts a club gets it going makes it last for a while and then burns out or gets family or has all these other issues and i always sort of felt like the only way these clubs survive is when you go away from that cult of personality that one individual because that was the brighton buccaneers right which was when i first came here that that was the team the Mm. brighton buccaneers it was craig savage who just single-handedly made that club happen and, and made it work and then when he decided you know what i'm done it just completely collapsed and so and it's, it's true with what you do, right? You know, if, if you're doing it, you need to get other people in there to because otherwise it will last only as long as you have the energy and the wherewithal to do it. Um, yeah. So that's why I'm always hoping for all these organizations, all these clubs, like to build up that infrastructure. And that's why junior programs help a lot because you get families invested in it, that they have yeah. their kids and then they get involved. And if you can keep that pipeline going, you're always going to, and I think that's one of the reasons the London Mets have been so successful. Yeah, uh, funny enough, Drew Spencer was talking about the other day when I had him on. We were talking about um, he, he was worried about the amount of teams that didn't have a youth setup. So well, that, that's intro- the way it's, it, the, the, the club survive. You've got to have that pipeline, like you said. Yeah, and there was a huge discussion about that at one point, a, a number of times during my involvement. There was discussion that it, in order to be in the National Baseball League, you had to have a youth setup. They were trying to make that happen, and it just wasn't wasn't quite realistic to make that fully work, but that's sort of an idea to try and create a structure that sort of imposes that into being able to perform at the highest levels at the club, the club setup, but it's tough, you know, it's tough. It's tough to get people interested uh, in any sport uh, ever. And especially when it's, you know, not a major sport you don't see it on TV and you can't, dream and and that's what's so great about what drew is doing and and the world baseball classic that hopefully it creates an opportunity for kids to dream on why they would play yeah i think infrastructure is first and foremost because everyone loves playing on great fields it gets people excited and the more you have things like farnham park and even better the more likely you're going to have kids who are just going to come out and want to try it because when you go out to an uneven field where you're putting up the fence beforehand it takes a little bit more drive and then you need to have success to, as, as something aspirational. And, and obviously that's difficult. And one of the big issues when I first started playing for the great Britain national team in 96, I was one of the first two players they ever brought over just to play on the national team who were mm-hmm. non British based. So the whole team was born and bred except for myself and a guy named Pete Arthur. And then I got more involved in the recruiting process over the, you know, I played in five European championships yeah. didn't play in 97, but then in 99, I helped recruit players. And really 2001 was the first where we created a tryout series. I was living in Los Angeles. We created a tryout series. That's where Alex Smith started playing Matt Stockman, yeah. uh, Tucker Stockman's dad. Those are the first experience Ian Young's first experience, because even then, you know, 2001, it was hard to find people on the internet. So I set that up. Eddie Delzer, who had a short, tenure with the national team was one of the one of the greatest players of that era to play he had 
won a NCAA Division I World College World Series championship. He was the pitcher in the championship game for Cal State Fullerton. And he'd been born in the Liverpool area. And we had played together for years on an adult team in LA. And I had no idea about it. And then one day it's like, oh yeah, I was born in Liverpool. I'm like, got to get you a passport. You got to come out. So he played for us in 2001, pitched great got a, a win against Russia the year they won the silver. I think Alex Smith came on your show and talked about his experience closing that game. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was interesting just to see that development because there was tremendous tension during that era between how many of those players do you want to bring in to make us more competitive and how many born and bred British players should you have on that team? Hmm. I, I'm not privy to how much that discussion still goes on. You know, I think, increasingly there've been fewer born and bred players on the teams. And we've sort of leaned into, you know, the dominion, you know, the Commonwealth and all the other opportunities, obviously for the world baseball classic, but even for the euros where you have to have a passport. So, uh, you know, that's, that's tough, right? Because you want to dream on it and you want to believe you can get there, but if it doesn't seem that there is a, a, a path for that, then it's questionable. But the reason I, I, I'm okay with the path we're going on is that what we're seeing increasingly, I mean, Alex Malhudis, Will Linter, and these guys were trailblazers, Alex particularly, to go over to the U.S. and play at Menlo, which opened yeah. the door then for Will to go and play there. Uh, you had Michael Johnson end up coming over to the U.S. Uh, a number of players were just starting to trickle through during my tenure. Now you're seeing it more and more where you have you know, Ryan Brereton, you know, these players who come over, they're getting to opportunities in the U.S., I worked as a sports agent representing European players for many years and worked very hard on trying to get opportunities for European players to play at junior colleges. And then hopefully from there, go to division one schools. And I, I think, I mean, I, I don't want to take any credit for it, but like overall we've seen now a tipping point, I think throughout Europe and hopefully with great Britain where those opportunities are becoming greater and greater so that people don't see it like, okay, I'm going to go straight from playing for the London Mets to play in the world baseball classic, but I'm going to go from the London Mets to go play either in a junior college or a division three college in the U S maybe if I do well there, I'll go on the transfer portal. I'll end up at a division one school Then maybe I can get signed. And then maybe I'm going to be representative. So there's like a runway for it now that probably didn't exist when I was playing. Yeah. And so I, I'm not as worried about that composure of those national teams as much because I feel like maybe there's more of a chance to get there through a different path than just, playing domestic baseball and then going to play for your national team. Yeah. Speaking of World Baseball Classic, what do you think of uh, this this year's performance? Oh, my gosh. It was so exciting, Matt. I can't even <laughs> begin to tell you. What I just loved about that team was just how gritty. They were just bulldogs, right? I mean, it's everything you want to see in that stiff neck British attitude of I will not give up, um, which sometimes in sports you don't see with England, you don't see with GB, right? Uh, but that team had it, that team had it in spades. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it was just the chemistry, the coaching, probably a combination of all of it. Uh, but watching that team, I broadcast the uh, qualifier that was in Regensburg a number of years ago yeah. uh, when GB played and Canada ended up getting the spot from it. Canada was in that pool, uh, Czech Republic and Germany. And just, and that team was good. And there were good players on it. I had friends on that team. There were still players I played with on that team. Bradley was on that team, Brad Marcelino. Um, I think Alex Smith was still playing. But you look at the players now, and it's just, I give a lot of credit to uh, Stefan Rapalia and Liam leading into Drew. Uh, obviously, Drew is fantastic. But Liam and Stefan, I think sometimes forgotten in, in that sort of history, that arc because Liam did such a great job, but Stefan really started that process of really professionalizing the recruiting. And I don't want to take anything away from, uh, you know, Gary Roberts or Ralph, you know, Ralph Rago or, you know, all the other guys who kind of came before him, but those three guys just were really good at I, identifying is half the battle. Someone who was involved in the process of trying to find players in 2001 and 2005, you can't identify the players, but convincing them, that they should be a part of this is very hard for particularly European championship because you don't have a lot of the funding, you know, the timing doesn't work if you're professional. So getting this world baseball classic slot is going to help that recruiting so much more. It sort of feeds on itself because people see like, okay, I can play against 
Paul Goldschmidt. I can play against Mike Trout. Like, you know, there is a value to representing Great Britain and you don't have to sell that as hard. Yeah. And that's a testament to Drew to getting the team there and hopefully they can build on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a fantastic set of games coming up. I'm really excited of it. Um, one of the, the people that I know quite well and listeners, I know Ian Bleese from Liverpool Trojans just confirmed these guys' tickets to come out to Arizona and go and see it. Are you, are you going to go over and, and watch don't the know. games? I, I don't know yet. I mean, I'm already in the U.S. It's in Phoenix. It should be doable. I, I, you know, I have this job. I've spent so much time this year uh, using vacation to curl, to continue to follow my passion as an athlete. So I, I don't know whether I'll make it, but, uh, you know, even if I'm not there, I will fork out whatever the dollars are to watch every single game. There's no doubt yeah. about that. I mean, I'm so excited for that team. Uh, you know, Brad, Brad's first time on the Great Britain national team was in 1999. He was my roommate and he was 17 years old and I was an adult and he was so quiet. And just to see his success, uh, you know, as a coach, a player, but more so as a coach, it's just, it's so incredible. Um, he's such a great human being. And so that he's playing a role there is great. All those guys. I mean, I just, I have a lot of respect for all the people who are in the setup. And, but what I said when, you know, we have a Great Britain alumni group on Facebook. And I said, all these people deserve so much credit, but so does every person who played in the program for the 30 years previous since, you know, 1968, you know, when we really we started playing, uh, you know, GB started really playing in Euros because it took every link in that chain to get to this day. You needed all those people to keep the flame going. And sometimes the flame flickered quite a bit. I was lucky in my period, we stayed in the A pool the whole time I was, we won the B pool in 96 and stayed in the A pool until I was done. And then the year after I was gone, because they need to get rid of me to do really well, they won the silver medal at the Euros in, in 2007. But, you know, but even the players who played in the years before that were up and down from the A pool, all those people needed to come out, needed to volunteer their time to be that link of the chain to get to where we are today. And I, I sort of wanted to remind all those players, you know, guys like Matt Gilbert, you know, guys who maybe people don't know about who, who invest a lot of time into baseball that, you know, they were part of this, that they deserve credit, not on a major level, but on some level to, 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 to getting us to where we are today. Yeah. Some good names to shout out then. I suppose, uh, would, would any of them make your ballot for the GB Hall of Fame? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely, as you know, I, I, uh, I helped sort of found it and then was a voter for a number of years. And then people were nice enough to put me up for it. And I turned down being a nominee for a number of years because I sort of felt like, well, wow, that seems really weird because I helped put it together. And then finally, I was like, well, screw it. You know, if I, so I left the voting body for three years. I was elected in and then came back and I've nominated so many people from those eras. I, you know, obviously my great expertise and where I'm always really trying to focus on is like the 1950s and earlier, because I feel like yeah. people really don't know that era. And thankfully there's a small group of people now that we have a sort of a separate voting pool for that sort of pre-modern era of people who know what's going on and know that history. But yeah, I mean, obviously the era I played in, there are a lot of players who I really liked and, and sort of supported. Um, and then, you know, truthfully, there are players who get attention there who I played with and I'm like, eh, I don't know. But what I really try and do is to take away my personal opinions of the players and, and look, there's a criteria, a set of criteria for the Hall of Fame. And I try and look very closely at the criteria and say, okay, do I think stepping away from my personal experience with these players that they should be there. And that's how I vote. I tend to be a little bit more of an inclusive Hall of Fame than exclusive. There's always an issue with, you know, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, the one in Cooperstown. It's like, do we want a, you know, an arms wide open Hall of Fame or a narrow Hall of Fame? I generally tend to be more arms wide open because my whole pitch for the Hall of Fame when we started this, when I went to Joe and said, let's do this, was this is a great opportunity for history that hopefully people go in and they read their histories of these players and learn more about the game. I love going to the portrait gallery in yeah. London, you know, yeah. off Trafalgar Square, because you see these great portraits, but then you read about them and it's, it's, that's how you learn the history. It's not looking at the pictures and saying, Oh, that's a neat, neat painting, but it's reading their histories and you use that as a hook. 
And I feel like that's what the Hall of Fame should be on some. I mean, you don't want to make it crazy inclusive like everybody ever played. Um, but, you know, you, you want the players who are good in their era uh, to get that attention, but then also hopefully pulling other people and be like, oh, I'm curious about who these guys were. Yeah, definitely. It, it's uh, It's been really good because I've, I've been looking at the the historical ones to try and do more of a feature for any sort of the pool of people willing to come on. You know, I, I don't have a bottomless pocket to try and bribe people to be a guest. <laughs> um, checks are in the post, people, I promise. Um but yeah, just just being able to look at the people that, that like you said before, were, were the founders for what we're now playing, the the legacy that they've they've left. There's just interesting stories and tales out there, and just to try and do like a, a feature, maybe it's just like twenty minutes, just to talk yeah. about them so that people are aware of, of who they are. It just means you've got to listen to me for twenty minutes, which is never good. No, stop it. Now, you know what I found really fascinating about the voting panel. We're all people who have knowledge or a real desire. And I know you're, you're on it now yeah. um, is that uh, it's not a hive consciousness. It's not a hive mentality. No. I voted for people in the past that didn't get in who I was like, that guy really, or, or woman should really be in. I I'm shocked. And there are people who honestly, I've been like, really? Like, I'm surprised I knew that guy. I played with them. Huh. So, uh, I, and I appreciate that. Like, I really am grateful that it's like that because uh, it shows that people are really thinking and everyone have different perspectives. Yeah. Well, I've just got my 10 minute warning for uh, for wrapping up, not from the better half, but from, from Zoom. Uh, so before before we knock this on, I, I literally could, we, we could, we've got to do this again to, to get more conversations in because you should be doing British baseball podcast. Ah. <laughs> you should, you should, because of the stuff that you know, it's just honestly, because it's like, and I know that the, the listeners will be in agreement with this because they listen to your show as well. Just yeah, the, the knowledge that you've got is brilliant. And, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to to share this stuff and and for writing books on the, the subject as well. You know, if it if it weren't for people like you, then there's no British baseball podcast trying to, you know get these things documented and you, you, you are continue. too kind but i will say that my enthusiasm for it from day one first game i ever played for great britain was at men with hill in a friendly before we went to play at the the b pool euros from that day on I, I was hooked i cared deeply about the players what they give how their desire yeah um their, their thirst and hunger for knowledge. And I, I would hope if you asked any of the guys I played with over the years on the GB team, you know, from Brad to Alex Smith, to Alex Malhudis, Alan Bloomfield, that they would say, you know, good, bad, whatever as a player, but he really cared. And I do, I care deeply about British baseball. I always have. Yeah, indeed. So I'm going to ask you a quick question before we go. And it's not the one that I said before we, we ended last chat. Uh, who would make your British baseball Mount Rushmore? Four, four players or individuals? Gosh, that's super hard. Um, I feel for the year I played, you got to have Alan Bloomfield, who was just a fantastic player during that era. Uh, you have to have someone from the 30s. It's hard to determine who, but I'd probably go with Roland Gladden just because, uh, you know, a major, major leaguer who played in Great Britain for, for a couple of years. Hmm. Beyond that, it gets sort of hard uh, in the more recent period. I mean, it, you know, the criteria is everything, right? Because mm -hmm. is it, if, you know, if we go just national team, you know, you could just say jazz chisel, right? Like, you know, you could go that way. Uh, but I sort of feel like you have to have played domestically on some level to kind of reach reach my, uh, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore. Hmm. Uh, Michael Escui, probably. I mean, he was yeah. just such a dominant player when he was here. I know that's more recent. I don't know for the last one. I'm trying to think of an era that I haven't covered because I want to cover another era. Uh, maybe someone like Wally O'Neill from the 50s. Yeah. He's such a dominating pitcher during that period. That's probably a little imperfect, um, but uh, that, that's what I'll go with for now. I, I would have to give it more thought. So That's a good one. I like, I like Wally's on there from, uh, from Stratford. Yep. Good list. I like it. Excellent. All right, uh, Josh, thanks again so much for coming on. Uh, I know that the time zone differences have been not, not ideal for us to do as a call. So again, more appreciation for, for you giving us time. Um, what's next? 
Uh, I'm going to find out in the next week whether my team makes the uh, men's nationals, the U.S. nationals, top eight teams in the U.S. If I do, I get to play in it, which is exciting. I live in Denver. And if we do, uh, it's actually being hosted in Denver at the Denver Coliseum, a nice 10,000 seat arena here. So uh, it'll be fun to play in front of friends and family if we make it. So it, it looks very promising. So we'll see. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much again. Take it easy, mate. I'll chat well, to you soon. I thought you were going to ask you the, the, the oh, go two. On. Yeah, we've got six minutes. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, let's do the two two um, two lies and a truth. Oh, two. Okay. Oh, okay. How I got this two. wrong? Two truths and a lie. Yep. Yeah. Okay, because I thought good. about it when we were switching over. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, okay. So, the first one is that I've flown on Air Force One, you know, oh. the plane with the president. Yeah. The second one is that one of my European books won an award for best book from Saber, which is the Society of American Baseball Research. Yeah. And the last one is that I once appeared in a picture in People magazine where there were three people in it, and it was a picture of me. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman together. That's, oh, you know the book one, I think is definitely a truth. I'm going with Air Force One being the lie. Final answer? Yeah. No, that's true. I flew on Air oh, Force wow. One with, uh, with Bill Clinton when I was a reporter. Uh, I have been in People Magazine. Uh, the picture exists of me with uh, Tom and Nicole when I was covering the Oscars on the red carpet. I have won a Sabre Award for writing, but not for either of my books. I won it for uh, something I wrote about the history, a, a unique occurrence in Major League Baseball when a pitcher comes into a game and doesn't get a single out. And I called it a lump, a lamentably unproductive mound performance. And I wrote, I wrote a piece, a 10,000 word essay on the history of the lump throughout major league baseball and so i won a award for that but never for either of my books sadly which i really wanted i've got to be honest i was really aiming for it and i didn't get the love for the books yeah you've yeah, got a great poker face because you kept that straight when i said it because i knew that you got an award for it because when i was doing research from like episode four of you on back in 2019 i, I knew you had a, an award for, for your writing that's why i thought that was true yeah ah good one Nice. All right. Do you usually get? The, do you usually catch out the lie? Oh no, I'm useless. <laughs> yeah, I'm really bad. But I think that just speaks a lot about the. Well, everyone knows that the British baseball is, they're a special sort, so any of them could be true. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, like the stories you told then, it's like Air Force One. Yeah, you could have done because again, you journalism, but also you you write in awards, read your books, and Tom Nicole. I mean, well, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard words in like I've I've had two world records. Nice. Most zombies in a city center, and most contestants in a in a what's it called in a game show. It was nice. on a one versus one hundred on the Xbox Live. You had to class nice. it as a world record. It's like, well, now I've got that. And a load of us dressed up like zombies ambling <laughs> around Manchester <laughs> City Center, a good couple of thousand of us rocking. Buses. So just really random, obscure stuff. Could be anything. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. There you go. Well, I'm glad we snuck that in. I still got two yeah. minutes. There you go. Well, Matt, uh, always a pleasure to chat with you, my friend. Thanks, man. All right. All right. Take easy. Take care. All right.